He couldn't do it, so he had to go. There were restrictions and limitations on other immigrants, particularly on Catholics and Jews, Southern and Eastern Europeans. But other than Asians, no other racial or national group was absolutely prohibited from naturalizing. No other racial or national group was absolutely prohibited from immigrating. And none of the other groups, though they clearly were disfavored, and that disfavor was put into the law, were restricted on the basis of race. Uh, for, for all other immigrants, other than Asians, the question was nativity. Where were you born? And it, it was better under the law to have been born in England or Germany rather than Russia or Poland. But for Asians, people of Asian race attempting to immigrate to the United States, place of birth was irrelevant. The only question was, uh, what is your race? The racial restrictions on Asian immigration remained in effect until 1965. Uh, until 1965, there was a, a cap of admission, total worldwide number of Asians allowed to come into the United States was 2,000. 1964 and 1965, as I assume everyone in this room knows, were terribly important years for racial relations in the United States. We have the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Immigration and Nationality Act Amendments of 1965, which eliminated race as a factor. <coughs> Uh, in immigration to the United States. This is the statute, the Immigration and Nationality Act Amendments of 1965, that will turn the United States into a majority minority nation through the process of immigration. There is some scholarly debate about whether the change in the immigrant stream that resulted from the race neutralization that took place that year was intended or whether it was an unintended consequence. Some people think, some scholars argue, that the diversity of the United States that now exists, that the diversity of the United States that now exists in this room was an accident, that Congress never would have passed the law had they known what would happen. My analysis of the legislative history is, uh, is that Congress did mean to end the racism of the past, that this that their, uh, that their the race neutrality that was put into the law was intentional and that they wanted people to immigrate without consideration of race and without consideration uh, of the idea that it would be undesirable to, uh, to change the demographic nature of the United States. Nevertheless, it's clear that Racists have not gone away in this country. It, it seems clear to me that, that uh, perhaps among a minority, but among some, Asians are regarded as ineradicably foreign, uh, as dangerous. We see many examples of people not uh, interested in differentiating members of one Asian group for another. When we think about the terrible events that, uh, that brought us here today, uh, it, it's clear, of course, that people are responsible for their own actions, and that, that even the bigoted people with closed minds have some responsibility for that, too. It's up to them to uh, educate themselves and, and think uh, in a way that they believe is right. That being said, this history suggests to me that it wasn't somebody who was alive today who invented the idea that Asians were dangerous, that Asians were foreign, that Asians were not legitimately part of the United States. That idea uh, comes from the past. That idea comes uh, uh, from others. Racism towards Asians, thinking of diverse groups of people of color as an undifferentiated uh, mass, is, as the Supreme Court said, a part of our history as well as our law. 
it, it was, at least for a time, welded into the structure of our national polity by a century of legislative and administrative acts and judicial decisions. And to me, at least, even after almost 50 years of a race-neutral immigration policy on the books, it, it, it doesn't surprise me that there are echoes of this very important and persistent idea even today. Thank you. Uh, before uh, I invite our next speaker, uh, there's a student who wants to make a quick announcement regard regarding the Sikh Studies um, uh, student group. So, Hello everyone, um, my name is Kamal Kar and I'd like to make two announcements. Um, one of the events that the Vipshi Club, um, sorry, the Vipshi, which is the Pub Puran Singh Health Initiative, wants to invite all of you to um, the Yuba City Nagpirtan, which is happening on November 4th, that's a Sunday. It's right here in Yuba City, so um, like Professor Mon um, presented in his slides, if you want to see a big celebration of Sikh pride, Yuba City is the place to go. Um, you can actually see the wide um, gathering of all the Sikhs here in California. It's the biggest celebration. And um, also, on the behalf of SCA, I'd like to invite you guys all to our CQ workshop, which will be held November 6th. And details for this can be found on the SCA Facebook page, or you can contact a board member, which are relatively sitting on this side of the room. And um, like Professor Wan also said at the end of his lecture, um, the Wisconsin shooting was a product not of bigotry, but of ignorance. So if you'd like to enhance your knowledge on the Sikh religion or Punjabi um, people, please come to the workshop. Thank you. Next, I invite Rajbir Ajaj, uh, who is a third year uh, graduate student um, here in the Department of History, who works on modern South Asia and issues of travel and subjectivity. So very much on point today's talk. Thank you. Yeah, this is from a, this is like a paper I'm working on. Um, I thought I presented here, and it's entitled um, the political possibilities of Khalistan, question mark, um, the limits of secularism and liberalism and the Sikh community. So, I'll start. Though my paper is entitled Political Possibilities of Khalistan, I'm not interested in delineating a normative position on what should constitute a Sikh homeland. Rather, my purpose is to offer a few reflections on how Sikh reactions to the Oak Creek Godwara shooting preclude certain possibilities for Khalistan and how these limitations are intertwined with liberal and secular discourses that also limit political possibilities for other communities within the United States. So those Sikh reactions to the Oak Creek Godwara shooting have been variegated. One response in particular is conspicuous. Sikhs say that they're peace-loving and freedom-loving Americans alongside its rejoinder that this does not stipulate that violence should be perpetrated onto Muslims. This response, however, betrays a certain blindness to the violence enacted by the state every day. The rather simple point that Muslims are shot and killed daily in the war on terror, though only deemed to be collateral damage. One of the reasons this violence is enacted upon those Muslims and is considered acceptable is because they are deemed ideological and fundamentalist in contrast to the objective and true liberal democratic citizens of the United States. For secularism demands, as Talal Assad argues, that belief should either have no direct connection to the, one, to the way one lives or be held so lightly that it doesn't affect how you live. Secularism can only work as a political arrangement if belief is, um, but it doesn't connect to everyday life. So Muslims are construed as different because it assumes they cannot escape the ideological structure of their religion and participate in the political structure of a secular non-ideological state. This violence abroad against fundamentalist Muslims um, of, yeah, abroad then manifests itself throughout the United States, where Islam becomes inseparable from fundamentalism. Um, and we can see this from the discussion about the construction of the mosque in New York City and in recent mosque birth in Joplin and in the Oak Creek shooting at the Sikh Gorbara. This violence against politicized religion in, a, in the secular public sphere is quite similar to what Sikhs experienced at the hands of the Indian government. 
for the liberal democratic Indian government also employs technologies of violence to control a population deemed unable to function within the state. This is different though because the formation of the Indian nation state is, does not follow the chronological sequence of western states. Antinomous relationship between political sovereignty and the administrative reality of governmentality with India was produced differently than in the West. This is what part of the strategy argues is the heterogeneous social which then leads to popular sovereignty. This is different because in the US popular sovereignty comes before heterogeneous social groups, right? I create a civil society and then I bring others into it. In India what happens is through the colonial state, technologies of governmentality um, predate the nation state. So, um, so they bring they first divide communities and then bring them back together. So this is the process of like classifying. In South Asia, the classifying, reporting, and detailing of population groups in order to create policies related to land, settlement, revenue, crime prevention, regulation of religious places existed half a century before the nation states of India, Pakistan, and like Sri Lanka emerged. Popular sovereignty did not exist and populations were not citizens, but subjects in a heterogeneous space. These classificatory criteria, however, define and continue to define governmentality within post-colonial states, where the story of citizenship in the modern West moves from institutions of civic rights and civil society to political rights in a fully developed nation state. Therefore, unlike in the West, those included in civil society in India are restricted to a small section of cultural equipped citizens who are then sequestered from wider popular life of communities. And this is an elite politics. Civil society in India is an open to all. Um, and then this is different from the heterogeneous spaces that were created in the colonial state, and those constitute for part of charity, political society. So once the Sikh militant population was considered unable to function within the limits of political society and transgressed too much the demands that challenged the legitimacy of Indian liberal democracy, then the Indian government stepped in because the Indian government does still attempt to control who are those who are considered non-citizens. Torture, then like warfare, becomes a strategy in order to maintain the interests of the nation state and control those outside a civil society. And we can see this violence, right? This is the violence that occurs um, with the demand of Khalistan in the Asian Games in 1883, um, the Sikh pogroms after 1984. Um, but this is, I want to make sure, this is not a particular argument about the inability of India to correctly implement liberal democracy, but rather that even though liberalism is produced differently within dissimilar histories, there still remains something essential to the liberal state that produces violence. Though the liberal state attempts to separate the idea of violence from the idea of politics, violence remains integral to liberalism as a political form. For within this particular pro uh, political formation, as Assad writes, some humans have to be treated violently in order that humanity can be redeemed. In the United States, we maintain the nation state through acts of torture upon non-citizens as well. We just have to think of Guantanamo Bay and attempts to militarize the border by implementing fences. These differences between notions of civil society and political society are different in the United States though. Though political society exists, there are heterogeneous social groups that are not a part of the civil society. I think as you know, Hurricane Katrina showed quite clearly, we do have political society. Um, the, there, most of all of us are considered a part of civil society. Thus, governmental um, agencies that direct and look after certain groups within the heterogeneous social populations outside the hegemonic conception of citizen, so citizens outside of so, yeah, citizens that would be considered outside the civil society are forced to negotiate within the neoliberal order by privatizing and commodifying their identity and universalizing liberal democratic values. So the question of we are here changes into what kind of we is possible in this here. Sikh identity then becomes one of simply culture, void of any politics that reflects Sikhism's own historical narrative. The contradictory role of the turban is quite clear here. The turban remains an object that can be multifaceted, multifaceted terrifying, and a marker of irre, um, irre, irrevocable difference because of the heteronormative frame um, the white middle class posts on it, or it can be a sign of simple depoliticized identity, as Jean-Paul Gaultier's recent inclusion of the turban in the fashion show shows. 
The term's dual role is being worked out right now in Western politics. Just think of it like um, the licite in France. The term then becomes a religious marker and a cultural marker. Another, the nugget that was mentioned is another example of this. It can only exist within. Yeah, that's good. I don't know. I was like worried. I was gonna make it. The nugget is another example of this. It can always be justified in economic and culturalist terms, but not in political terms. We can't have the nugget as a political event. Rather, it can only be an economic or culturalist event. So the process of incorporating Sikhs within civil society continues through education. For education is a technique that the state employs in order to interpolate members of civil society. We must not forget that education today tracks a very specific genealogy that also has very distinct notions of what constitutes religion and subjectivity. For inter interactions and representations are not simply an issue of how one culture portrays another, but rather the, the very categories we use shifted. So Sikhism has to be taught and enunciated as religion in order to shape it as permissible within the liberal democratic framework. The recent attacks on Chicano studies provide another example of how only the identity that is possible within liberal liberalism is a depoliticized identity. Once Chicanos locate their identity in a politics outside of liberalism, then we cannot allow them to teach their identity in schools. This is not to say education is not an important strategic element for Sikhs to disseminate the knowledge of their people. Where we all function within this conceptualization of education, it is within us all. For European thought is indispensable for us to think and thinking about our experiences in political modernity. But rather, we still need to think about how this knowledge can be renewed from the margins, as Jake, the Pace Chakrabarty argues. This is my kind of my end. So, what does this discussion hold for the political possibilities of Khalistan? Do I agree with part of the Chatterjee that we need to recognize the importance of civil society and political society? I wonder how much that the political society that is formed within the nation can challenge the existing neoliberal order. Moreover, though the colonial project enacted great symbolic and actual violence against, for example, the Sikh, Muslim, and Chicano traditions, there still remain possibilities for emancipatory politics within these historically embodied traditions. For example, political Islam, political Sikhism, Aslan, these are different modes of vernacular democracies, as Arvind Palmander argues. And if we move away from the binaries of religious and secular um, that these religions are, these uh, traditions are taught in, we can allow them to speak. We need to allow the vibrant political tradition that the Sikhs do have, from the Sikhs gurus to their more recent demand for a homeland, Khalistan and Testu. Or we're left with a rather, or another question emerges that we have to ponder. Is the demand for a Khalistan simply a reiteration of the American neoliberal order into what Sikhs consider to be their homeland in Punjab? Uh, our final speaker of the day is Professor Richard Kim. He's Associate Professor of Asian American Studies. Um, his first book was on Korean, uh, on Korean diasporic nationalism, and his current project concerns pan, a pan, uh, pan Asian social movement around uh, ex death row inmates. I hope I said that all correctly. Yes. <laughs> uh, I invite uh, Professor Kim. Thank you. I give you a pass with high honors. <laughs> Thank you for, for coming out tonight. I'm assuming you're all Dodgers fans. One reason why you're here. Um, as um, Professor Tixan said, my esteemed colleague uh, Sunaina Myra is on sabbatical this year in Palestine, so I have been brought in as a proxy. Um, but uh, Professor Tex Tixan asked me to speak about um, an Asian American studies perspective on the uh, Oak Creek uh, shootings and. Um, so I, since this is exam week, I, I sort of saw this as a prompt. And so in thinking about how I would answer this prompt, I thought about how I would talk about uh, the shootings in the classroom at the undergraduate level. And um, the first and obvious thing is that we could frame this historically, that um, in much in the ways that Professor Chin talked about, um, how this uh, shooting is part of a long history of anti-Asian violence and hate crimes committed against persons of Asian descent in the U.S. on the grounds of being uh, perpetual foreigners, forever foreigners, as, as being un-American. Um, 
And so with the early arrival of Sikha Punjabis in the early 20th century, the Orientalist tropes that grew out of the anti-Chinese, anti-Japanese movement um, became attached to Punjabis. And uh, hence they were vilified as the new yellow peril, as some of the literature at the time uh, extolled. And so this eventually led to their exclusion as racialized aliens ineligible for citizenship. Um, and on the grounds that they were perceived as inassimilable, as a, they constituted a threat to American society. And so ironically, even though uh, Punjabis were uh, legally or scientifically classified as Caucasians at the time, uh, they came to be constituted legally as aliens ineligible for citizenship, much like the Japanese, Koreans, and Chinese that preceded them. Um, so we don't see a, a dramatic increase in South Asian immigration until the mid-1960s as a result of the immigration exclusion coming out of the citizenship cases. And um, in the mid-1980s, we this is the time of a resurgence of the modern minority thesis where Asian Americans are extolled as being an exemplary minority in American society. Um, we see an exponential rise in hate crimes being committed against uh, people of Asian descent. And so in terms of the South Asian community, you have the dot busters of the mid-1980s. Um, a rash of murders and violence committed against uh, Indian immigrants in northern New Jersey. And a similar kind of rhetoric of their un-Americanness uh, uh, was cited by the perpetrators. One was also, uh, they, they talked about the economic success of these immigrants. Um, and this was coupled with their un-Americanness. Um, so, and these hate crimes that were committed during the 1980s um, typically were not perceived as hate crimes or racially motivated um, crimes, but rather as isolated, isolated incidents or incidents of extreme patriotism or incidents of deranged individuals rather than a, a pattern of racial violence. So this brings us to uh, the Oak Creek shooting. And um, we could talk about this in the context of identity politics. And uh, in the aftermath, there was uh, much talk about the misrecognition of the race and religion of, of the six um, who were mistaken to be uh, Muslim by the, the, the shooter here. And, um, and, and we talked about these are important points to make. And, um, and it aligned the long history, the long, rich cultural history of, of six. Uh, but one logical conclusion one could, could uh, conclude based on this kind of rhetoric is that um, in this discourse of not being Muslim, that then it would be understandable or acceptable if they were Muslim. Um, and at the same time, I remember there was a, a mosque burning um, in Illinois around the same time, and that received very little uh, press coverage at the time. Um, so so it, with the larger context then, this war of terror where South Asians are targets of, of the U.S. government in the war of terror, along with uh, Muslims and Arabs, um, has created this large...